What I'm uh, discussing today is an ongoing research and I'm embarking on uh, looking at the issue of sectarianism uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, uh, when we think of sectarianism uh, within the, uh, especially within the Muslim world, uh, we often uh, read and we think of sectarianism as one uh, that pits the Sunni majority uh, community against the Shiite minority community within the Muslim world. Now, uh, to give, uh, since this is a one-on-one -on -one lecture, perhaps I should uh, just mention quickly the difference between Sunni and Shiite Islam. Uh, Sunni Islam, uh, the divide between Sunni and Shiite Islam uh, is really a political divide that occurred as a result of the issue of succession uh, to Muhammad. Shiites believe that the fourth caliph of Islam, uh, also the prophet but uh, son-in-law and cousin uh, was supposed to be the rightful heir to the leadership of the Muslim community. Whereas the Sunnis believe that anyone who is competent, uh, who is um, sane, who has good religious credentials can uh, lead the Muslim community. Now, um, um, can we move to the next slide, please? Now, in terms of how uh, scholars have basically conceptualized uh, this issue of sectarianism, there has been uh, numerous theories that have been forwarded um, in trying to understand why uh, we have this problem of sectarianism uh, in the uh, Muslim world, especially in the Middle East. Now, the first um, theory um, that is often forwarded is the issue of the colonial legacy. Uh, often um, scholars and also often journalists uh, who have uh, forwarded this, this opinion have argued that essentially is a Cyclist Picot agreement which divided um, the Middle East into the French and British spheres of influence. That really is the uh, starting point of, of uh, the sectarian uh, problem within the Muslim world. Uh, the argument that is being put forth is that uh, you basically have territories uh, within uh, certain countries such as Syria and Iraq um, that were constructed such that you will have a mixed population uh, comprising both uh, Sunnis and Shiite, uh, precisely because uh, the British colonial uh, and French colonial uh, powers wanted to weaken this future post-colonial state. Now, um, another uh, another theory that has been forwarded uh, is that uh, by scholars such as Syed Reza Ali Nasir, who wrote a very important book uh, titled The Shia Revival, where he spoke about this idea that in essence sectarianism is an ancient theological uh, difference. These, these differences have harked back to the time uh, after the death of Muhammad uh, and that uh, a lot of these differences uh, really stem from um, you know, jurisprudential as well as theological differences. Uh, this is also the view that has been forwarded uh, by many uh, leaders, especially uh, President Obama, for example, made a very uh, important speech regarding these ancient differences and how uh, it is not easy to overcome sectarianism. Now, more recently, uh, scholars such as uh, Professor Nadir Hashmi uh, have basically argued that, uh, look, you know, this issue of sectarianism is a lot more complex, not just, um, you know, the issue of colonial legacy or that there's some kind of um, you know, irreconcilable differences between Sunnis and Shiite, uh, that in essence, sectarianism um, can be understood if you look at how, you know, uh, the politics of the Middle East uh, actually work. In fact, he has argued that it is very much state-driven and rooted in the politics of authoritarian, authoritarianism and also shaped by regional politics, uh, such as, uh, for example, the current um, conflict uh, or regional competition between Iran uh, and Saudi Arabia. And also, he argued there are certain myths and stereotypes uh, that uh, held, uh, you know, uh, that Sunnis held against the Shiites and vice, and, and vice versa as well. And this is how sectarianism needs to be understood. Now, uh, Fanar Haddad, who is, of course, uh, a good friend of mine and also a scholar at the Middle East Institute, uh, you know, one of the people, uh, key scholars who have actually uh, looked at this issue of sectarianism, especially in the context of Iraq. Uh, he has argued that the term sectarianism itself is not a very useful term. Uh, in fact, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in order to try to understand this issue, you need to look at sectarian identities. Uh, 
uh, which he argued are deep, uh, deeply embedded in the prism of the nation state. Uh, and as such, it's very closely linked to the idea of nationalism uh, and national identity. So the national context uh, of the sectarian identities is very much contingent on the national context, how sectarianism or sectarian identities are developed, uh, utilized by, by uh, political leaders and so on. Next, please. Now, in the context of uh, Southeast Asia, I argue that um, sectarianism goes beyond the Sunni Shiite divide, and in fact, uh, is perhaps shaped a lot more by what I term as an intra Sunni divide, uh, especially between traditionalist Muslims uh, and Salafis. I will explain these terms uh, later on. Now, uh, this is not to say that there, we do not have any sort of um, problems between Sunnis and Shiites. Uh, clearly, the events in the Middle East uh, has shaped um, the way Shiites uh, are being perceived. Uh, in the you know in in Indonesia and in Malaysia uh, and uh, even in Singapore, uh, in fact, when we look at um, Malaysia, for instance, Malaysia is one of the countries, uh, perhaps one of the two countries in the Muslim world that officially ban Shiite Muslims. So, if you are Shiite, uh, you are Shiite Muslim. Technically, you can you cannot um, practice uh, within the context of uh, within in, in within Malaysian borders. Or, Although, of course, in terms of the implementation, it's a lot more complex. Um, often, uh, Malaysian or Malay uh, Shiites are targeted a lot more than uh, those, uh, you know, those foreigners who live outside of, uh, who, who live within in Malaysia. Now, um, in terms of the, and what, what is perhaps interesting as well is that this anti-Shiite attitude um, really began to take, it, it, it took shape a lot earlier, but it really uh, garnered a lot more, uh, perhaps, traction within many circles, uh, within Muslim circles in the region, um, after the Syrian conflict. Uh, so one interesting observation that I made, for instance, uh, the uh, party uh, group that I've studied for the last 10 years or so, the Pan-Malaysian Islamic Party, used to have very good relationship with Shiite groups um, at its annual meeting, you would find the Hezbollah uh, and Iranian uh, representatives, uh, you know, at, at every single annual meeting. Uh, but more recently, after the Syrian conflict, uh, uh, PAS has basically distanced itself uh, from Hezbollah, from Iran, and so on. Uh, you find that these uh, groups uh, now do not attend uh, or at least are not invited to past events. And I think this tells a lot about the dynamics of how what is happening in the Middle East impacts directly or indirectly politics in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, um, and I think that um, the another manifestation, and, and this is the manifestation that I'm interested in, is the Salafi traditionalist uh, divide. Now, in terms of trying to understand uh, sectarianism in Southeast Asia, I uh, feel that um, you know, conceptually it is useful uh, for me to borrow from Fanar's conception uh, about the importance of identity, but also about the idea of uh, symbolic boundaries that um, some scholars, especially in uh, sociology and anthropology, have uh, basically employed to look at other contexts, not necessarily of uh, sectarianism uh, per se. Uh, because I think in a lot of ways, um, how, how uh, people perceive themselves is very much shaped by identities and also boundaries of how they want to draw uh, these identities. And uh, these boundaries can be both uh, symbolic and uh, social in, in terms of uh, how we understand it. Next, please. Now, let me quickly go through uh, what I mean um, by this. Now, um, I think generally, you know, the identities, of course, are contestable, fluid and, and diverse uh, in general. Um, and if I can borrow uh, the works of uh, scholars such as Anthony uh, Cohen, Michel Lamont uh, and others, um, they have argued that, that social uh, boundaries, uh, you know, uh, are both uh, had, needs to be understood as both symbolic and structural. Now, how they distinguish between the symbolic in, in uh, social boundaries. Uh, so symbolic uh, boundaries represent essentially the conceptual distinction which social actors employ for uh, categorizing material reality as well as time and space. Uh, fundamental to the imagination of reality and a medium for acquiring status and resources, symbolic boundaries separate groups and substantiate the feelings of membership and inclusiveness. Social boundaries, on the other hand, are objectified forms of 
of social differences and stable behavioral patterns of association. Now, at the same time, the actualization of social boundaries uh, is often fully dependent on dependent on the shared concern, uh, concern, concern over symbolic uh, boundaries. And at the end of it, uh, boundaries are also shaped by context and the cultural repertoire, tradition and narratives that individuals have uh, access to. And in, in this case, uh, the of course, the Sunni and Shiite uh, cultural repertoires, narrative and tradition. And here uh, we can borrow perhaps, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nadir Hashmi's understanding of how biases have been utilized in terms of understanding uh, these differences. Now, uh, can we move on? Next. Now, I'm going to now move on to um, look at uh, Salafism and traditionalism, uh, both in the Malaysian I'm, and Indonesian context. I should have mentioned earlier that uh, I am limiting my, my study to, um, or at least this presentation, uh, to Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, I've got some interest as well in uh, this issue of uh, sectarianism in Singapore, uh, but for our purposes today, I'm just going to look at Indonesia and Malaysia. No, now, in terms of how um, Salafis in uh, Southeast Asia uh, have conceptualized or drawn their symbolic uh, boundaries, now, in essence, I think, um, and, and I think it's important to note that these symbolic boundaries uh, with Salafis uh, can actually be different in other contexts. Uh, so in, in, in certain, certain uh, contexts, uh, some of these uh, boundaries that I have mentioned uh, might be applicable. In some other contexts, they would um, uh, utilize or they will draw on other types of boundaries. Now, um, in essence, Salafism, uh, of course, is a... Um, is often linked to the Saudi uh, and, well conception of Islam. Uh, Salafism itself is a very uh, diverse category. There are numerous manifestations of uh, Salafism, of, uh, especially in the political realm. But uh, in terms of the symbolic boundaries, uh, all Salafis call on uh, the return uh, to the pious uh, ancestors. Now, in this case, uh, they argue that essentially there's a need uh, for Muslims to go back to the source of Islam, which is the Quran uh, and the Hadith or the Sunnah of the Prophet, which is the uh, practices of Muhammad that is to be emulated. Um, and they oppose the four schools of jurisprudence within Sunni Islam. Uh, you have the Hanbali, uh, Hanafi, Shafi'i, and Maliki uh, schools of jurisprudence. They believe that this practice uh, that there is you can go back to the source without needing scholars uh, to interpret. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, jurisprudential issues. Uh, of course, some Salafis uh, would argue that they subscribe to the Hanbali school, uh, but often, you know, at least in the Southeast Asian context, they, they are opposed to all four schools of jurisprudence. Uh, they are also opposed to what is known as innovation, uh, bid'ah or innovation. Uh, now, uh, what would uh, account for uh, innovations here would be, uh, for example, the uh, practices of visiting shrines, uh, celebrating uh, the birthday of the Prophet. Uh, although, ironically, uh, the Saudi king's uh, birthday is often uh, celebrated with a lot of uh, fanfare. Uh, and uh, they are also opposed to, the, uh, to a large extent to the primacy of rationality uh, over uh, scriptural evidence. So, as far as they're concerned, uh, scriptural evidence is a lot more important uh, than uh, rational uh, deductions. Now, um, often we would find that Salafis advocate for grassroots uh, Islamization uh, through uh, uh, piety. Now, um, uh, in this case, we would find, for example, uh, many Salafis in the context of Southeast Asia, not all, uh, would, uh, for instance, object uh, to the involvement, uh, their involvement in politics. Uh, so, sa Salafis who are um, influenced by religious scholars who are linked to the Saudi government would often uh, reject uh, political participation. In fact, they argue that uh, they should remain in the realm of religion, uh, preaching the Salafi uh, school of thought, uh, and to support essentially any government uh, of the day uh, to prevent uh, anarchy. Now, of course, there are also Salafis um, such as the Jihadi school of uh, Salafism uh, that would uh, call for uh, a violent struggle against any state that does not uh, implement uh, through Islam. Uh, and at the same time, also, 
um, certain schools of Salafism that believe that you can utilize uh, the democratic uh, means, such as uh, being involved in elections and so on, uh, to attain uh, power so as to uh, implement uh, the right or the the uh, true Islam uh, within within the state. Next, please. Now, in the context of Salafism in Indonesia, I think um, in terms of its historical and social political context, um, part of it, um, and this is perhaps true uh, for many of the other Southeast Asian countries, uh, it was a response uh, of Saudi Arabia to the expansion, uh, expansionist ambitions of Iran. Uh, when Ayatollah <coughs> Khomeini took over power in Iran after the Islamic Revolution of 1979, he declared that he wants to export uh, the revolution uh, to other parts of the uh, Muslim world. Now, at the same time, and so uh, naturally, uh, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia are deemed to be uh, natural pro uh, places or countries where this uh, exportation of the revolution is going to occur. Now, uh, much of the literature, for example, on Islamization um, in Southeast Asia argues that the Iranian revolution, in essence, have uh, provided, uh, is, is one of the key reasons to the revival, uh, to the Islamic resurgence in, in the region. I personally uh, disagree with this. I think that the Iranian revolution provided perhaps, a, a, you know, a sort of uh, inspiration for many Islamists, uh, you know, young Muslims in the region, but it was uh, essentially the Saudi response uh, to Iran that provided the tools uh, for uh, you know this, the resurgence to happen. Now, how did the Saudi uh, government? Um, how did they go about doing this? Uh, of course, they funded various activities, uh, and what, what's perhaps interesting is that the Saudi funding uh, in the early 1980s did not was not necessarily targeted. Uh, only to support the expansion of Salafism. Uh, many of the organizations that, that receive funding uh, or at least resources from Saudi Arabia uh, were not, um, you know, in any way Salafi organization. One uh, very significant group that I'll discuss later is the Dewan Dawah uh, Islamia Indonesia, which is in uh, you know it was established in 1967 by leaders of a band uh, Islamist party, the Masyumi. Uh, and uh, essentially, they decided to go into the realm of um, of dawa or proselytization and maintain a strong relationship with the Saudi state, and they receive uh, a lot of funding. And in terms of their own orientation, uh, they read a whole lot of different uh, a myriad of different Islamic scholars, from Said Qutb of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, to Maulana Maududi of the Jamaat Islami uh, in Pakistan. So we cannot really say that you know in the initial day this found the the funding uh, comes necessarily to spread uh, Salafism, but one of the key uh, perhaps reasons uh, or key avenues in which uh, Salafism did spread is the Saudi government began to give scholarships uh, for young Indonesians and Malaysians to go and study in Saudi Arabia, uh, and this um, gave birth to perhaps the first generation of Salafi scholars. Uh, who then went back to Indonesia to, to preach uh, the Salafi uh, doctrine. Now, um, the Soharto's uh, uh, government also had a very strict regulation on Islam's uh, political expression. Um, and interestingly, uh, this resulted in uh, the strengthening, uh, in fact, of Salafism, because uh, while he was trying to contain uh, political uh, Islam, he did not necessarily see the Saudi uh, uh, type of uh, proselytization as being a threat. And so Salafi groups were given a lot more uh, space uh, to preach essentially their ideas, essentially, uh, especially towards the end of his, uh, the second half of his uh, regime. So Arto allowed for the expression of Islam, in fact, utilized Islam for his own political purposes, but wanted this Islam to remain in the realm of personal uh, piety, uh, education, uh, you know, essentially realms that are non-political. A number of um, organizations begin to be, uh, begin to have links uh, to, uh, well, the Saudi version of, of Salafism. Uh, I've mentioned the Dewan Dawah Islamiyah, but another important uh, 
uh, institution is the Institute for the Study of Islam in Arabic or in Bahasa Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Islam dan Bahasa Arab uh, or better known as LIPIA. They established, uh, LIPIA was established by the Saudi government in 1980, basically the first foreign institution to hold formal educational activities in the country. Uh, and it had a direct uh, association with uh, a number of Islamic universities in Saudi Arabia uh, and they complemented uh, the courses uh, with, you know, um, study cells, study circles, running uh, da'wah training camps uh, and so on. Now, um, in more recent times, um, the Salafi um, uh, scholars, or at least Salafism, uh, has been spread using popular culture uh, uh, culture and uh, cultural tools and the media. Uh, one very good example of this is uh, for, for for the Singaporeans in the room, the Radio Hang. Uh, this was a radio station uh, that uh, broadcast uh, from uh, Batam, an island that is adjacent to Singapore. Uh, it was banned by uh, you know the Singaporean government because it was deemed uh, to essentially preach um, you know um, ideas that are. Uh, not conducive or that would uh, cause problems uh, within uh, the social, I mean, would, would rupture social cohesion uh, in Singapore. So in general, you would find Salafi scholars uh, teaching, of course, their understanding of Islam, but at the same time also criticizing other uh, Islamic sects that are deemed to be uh, practicing a form of Islam that is not uh, mainstream. Uh, so they would vilify, for example, the Shiites, the Ahmadiyyas, uh, the traditionalists, and so on. Next, please. Now, in the context of um, Salaf, in the context of Malaysia, similar to uh, Saudi uh, to Indonesia, there was of course this Saudi uh, ambitions in uh, basically countering the influence of Iran. Uh, perhaps one of the, one, an interesting point to note here is one of the recipients or very key ally of Saudi Arabia in uh, Malaysia. Is uh, uh, is Anwar Ibrahim? I mean, the well, uh, the waiting prime minister, uh, the designated uh, next prime minister, eighth prime minister of, of Malaysia, if that is going to happen. Now that's for another conversation. Um, now the uh, Anwar Ibrahim uh, was then the leader of the Assembly of Malaysian Muslim Youth, and he was appointed, for example. Uh, by the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, an organization that was formed by Saudi Arabia uh, to be Southeast Asian uh, coordinator. So that's how significant the influence is within the Malaysian context. And again, uh, the support for uh, funding uh, for uh, Islamic groups are not necessarily targeted initially at uh, Salafi organizations because you don't actually have many Salafi scholars. Uh, again, scholarships were offered. People went over and and over a period of time, uh, you begin to see the formation of newer institutions uh, within Saudi, within Malaysia, that then receive um, funding from Saudi Arabia. Now, um, one of the one perhaps difference between Malaysia and Indonesia is the political context. Uh, for since the nineteen eighties uh, till perhaps uh, prior to this, the the last election, which saw a change of government in in Malaysia. Uh, there has been a sort of Islamization race between uh, PAS and of the former uh, ruling party, the United Malay National Organization, uh, that sought to define the public role uh, that Islam uh, would play within the country. And this um, Islamization climate essentially opens up the space uh, for uh, Salafism, also opens up the space for a lot of other Islamic groups and Islamist groups to come in. Uh, and it was cleverly utilized by uh, the Salafis uh, basically to uh, to propound their own ideas. So uh, in 2014, for example, um, partly because they were persecuted in some states uh, by traditionalist religious scholars, uh, but also partly because they wanted to um, attain more influence within, within the government, uh, a group of uh, Salafi scholars uh, under the auspices of an organization called the Pratuban Elmuan Malaysia, um, joined AMNO, uh, uh, the ruling party, and uh, basically started preaching a Salafi, uh, the Salafi ideas within the party. So they form a kind of a, a, a ulama wing or religious scholars wing within uh, AMNO, uh, and 
they were beginning essentially to preach uh, to UMNO members at the grassroots level uh, their understanding of Islam, uh, which of course can be rather alarming if you think about it, uh, if UMNO was, was still in, in power. Now, in terms of um, the how you know the different institutions, uh, I've mentioned uh, Ilmuan, Pratuan Ilmuan, uh, Malaysia, but also many smaller educational institutions that were started uh, by Salafi scholars. Um, in particular, uh, for example, the Pusat Penajian Imam Shafi'i, uh, which was started in the state of uh, Penang. Uh, by uh, one of the key, I would say, Salafi uh, scholars in Malaysia, the Mufti of Perlis, uh, Dato uh, Asri Zanal Abidin. Now, um, he actually started a number, I mean, he, he was instrumental in spreading Salafism in uh, Malaysia uh, because of his charismatic, uh, you know, uh, his charisma, uh, and also because of his uh, organizational ability to form institutions to promote these ideas. Uh, what they have also done is um, Salafis have employed uh, what is known as street da'wah, uh, which is uh, basically a group of them going on the streets to preach Islam, uh, often to non-Muslims, but also to fellow uh, Muslims. And they have been very adept in utilizing uh, social media. The Abu Aki studio uh, would broadcast uh, the um, speeches of Salafi scholars uh, throughout uh, the country. Uh, and often, I mean, I've, I've been for... To some of these uh, talks and and so on, the the number of attendees are often very very small. It's often held in a small room, but because um, of the way uh, you know the broadcast is done, it they made it seem as if uh, there's a lot more you know, and, and that I think psychologically does impact uh, the attitude towards Salafism as being very mainstream, or at least they, them trying to mainstream uh, Salafism uh, within Malaysia. Now, um, can we move on? Next, please. I'm going to now move on to look at uh, traditionalism uh, in the context of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, here, I by traditionalist, I think there are a number of, uh, and of course, again, this is very um, different, very contextual, uh, what a traditionalist in Indonesia or perhaps Malaysia, um, you know, the kind of boundaries that they would uh, uh, employ would be very different from that uh, in of traditionalists in Pakistan, for example, uh, or Morocco. Now, they express allegiance to uh, this idea of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So, um, and essentially, the, the uh, idea is that they would follow um, the one one of the four schools of juris jurisprudence within Sunni Islam. They believe in um, in the Quran, in the Hadith, and uh, mo most importantly, I think uh, for a long time traditionalism or traditionalist Islam is often deemed to be moderate uh, because or at least uh, yeah because it was it subsumed a large part of culture within its ideas uh, so it would accept certain practices that are a lot more cultural in nature um, uh, that perhaps predated Islam uh, as being part of uh, Islamic belief. So, for example, um, prior to the coming of Islam or the spread of Islam, uh, you would often have celebrations uh, when a new uh, child is born. Uh, there are certain practices that, are, that would be associated a lot more with uh, Hinduism that continued um, till today. Uh, many traditions continue to practice it. Uh, perhaps changing just the kind of chants that the Hindu chants to Islamic uh, poetry, uh, Islamic verses, uh, recitations, and so on. So this is a huge difference between I think traditionalism, uh, traditionalist Muslim, and Salafism. Uh, they believe in the authority of the religious scholars and the role of Sharia, and I think this is something that is often, um, you know, left out in our understanding of traditionalist Muslim. It is often uh, sometimes we we kind of assume that traditionalist Muslims uh, uh, tend to be lax Muslim, and this is not true at all. I mean, if you look at uh, many of the anti-colonial movements uh, or opposition movements that have uh, started, uh, you know, um, since uh, the coming of Islam against uh, various authorities, it has always been about making sure that Sharia, uh, that the rule of Sharia is, is, uh, is respected, or Sharia is respected within, within the country. They also... Um, Traditionalist Islam is often promoted by uh, an expensive uh, Pasantren system uh, or Islamic boarding school in, in Malaysia. The term that is often used is the Pondok school. And as I mentioned, uh, 
traditionally Islam subsumes many uh, uh, beliefs, Sufi beliefs and practices. Now, if you are to perhaps speak to a traditionalist Muslim and ask them whether you are a Sufi, they probably will say no, but uh, because they don't necessarily uh, think of themselves that way. But many of the practices of traditionalist Muslims uh, could be argued uh, to be Sufi in, in nature. So, for example, uh, one practice that uh, Sufis often, um, you would find Sufis, uh, um, um, one ritual that you would find uh, Sufis practicing uh, is the reading of a particular verse on uh, Thursday night, uh, the Surah Yasin, um, that, uh, that is very uh, much uh, practiced in most mosques, I would say, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, continues to be the case. Now, um, so the historical context, can, can we move on, please, of traditionalism in Indonesia? I think traditionalism Islam remains the mainstream Islam. Uh, I would argue that uh, the large, the vast majority of Muslims um, in Indonesia and Malaysia continue to be traditionalists. Uh, now, what traditionalism means in the historical context uh, might not anymore be the case, and this is a point that uh, I am, I think, uh, an argument that I'm putting forth, that there has has been a, a redrawing of the symbolic boundary of what it means to be a Sunni Muslim or traditionalist Muslim. Now, um, in essence, traditionally Islam, um, in the case of Indonesia, is represented by uh, the largest Muslim organization in the country, perhaps in the world, the Nahdlatul Ulama, which was founded in 1926. Now, um, the idea essentially of uh, the Nahdlatul Ulama is to, it is a, a lot of different things. I mean, it's a welfare uh, organization. It is also a religious organization. And in more recently, uh, it has, uh, I mean, I would argue it's always played a political role, but um, it has become a lot more prominent in terms of uh, um, the political, uh, direct and indirect political uh, position that it is playing. Uh, so, for example, uh, in um, the upcoming presidential election, uh, you have a very senior cleric, uh, Kiai Haji Ma'aruf Amin, uh, who is going to be running as uh, the president's uh, vice presidential candidate, uh, uh, you know, and he hails from the Nahdlatul Ulama background. Now, uh, so the Nahdlatul Ulama represented this uh, kind of traditionalist Islam that I mentioned earlier, but over a per period of time, uh, you have we are beginning to see, um, you know, fractionalization within Nahdlatul Ulama, and also a very in uh, cohesive um, sort of discourse coming out from Nahdlatul Ulama. Now, uh, you would find, for example, at the central leadership level, the Nahdlatul Ulama to be uh, very much a, um, you know, a very moderate, pragmatic, in some ways, liberal uh, organization. Uh, they might be ritualistic, uh, but offers very, very um, liberal interpretation of Islam. But when you go to the grassroots level or you go uh, just to the provincial level, uh, the story is completely different. You would find, for example, Nahdlatul Ulama um, uh, leaders targeting um, you know, a minority Muslim uh, sects. If you look at attacks against uh, Shiites, uh, uh, against uh, the minority uh, Ahmadiyya sect, uh, and, and so on, uh, many of these attacks were carried out uh, by Nahdlatul Ulama uh, members. So I think uh, for us to then assume that traditional Islam is somehow all moderate and, and that is this foreign um, type of Islam that is coming in that is problematic, I think is in itself uh, something that we need to revisit. Well, at the central leadership uh, level, Nahdlatul Ulama has promoted this idea of Islam Nusantara um, or the Islam of the, the Malay world. Uh, this is somehow an Islam that is deemed uh, to be a lot more moderate. Uh, because the argument that has been put forth is that there has been an increasing Arabization of uh, Islam in Indonesia, that essentially these foreign influences are coming in, uh, in the form of Salafism, but also in the forms of group uh, like the Global uh, Islamic uh, Party, the Hezbollah Tahrir, and also uh, you know, influences from groups like the Egyptian uh, Muslim Brotherhood, coming to essentially alter uh, the kind of Islam, uh, the moderate Islam in the region to become a lot more puritanical and uh, intolerant. Uh, in actuality, though, I find, I myself find this um, argument a bit, prob not problem, a bit problematic, it's, it's really problematic because the assumption here is that the Arab world, uh, or 
there is a cohesive or homogeneous Islam in the Arab world or in the Middle East, which is not the case. Uh, if you look at Saudi Arabia alone, at least 20% of its population is Shiite. Uh, another 20% uh, would, uh, would affiliate with some kind of traditionalist Islam or Sufism. The same can be said about Morocco, Tunisia, uh, and so on. So I think it's very... Um, I think it is kind of a broad stroke analysis for, for us to assume that there is, uh, you know, this center that is uh, puritanical and the periphery that is somehow, somehow moderate. Uh, the other problem, I think, um, with this uh, notion of this Islam Nusantara uh, is also the assumption that somehow um, uh, the traditionalist Muslims are all uh, moderate. And, if, uh, and this brings me to my next point in terms of its uh, manifestation, although of course uh, most uh, many many uh, groups associated with Naruto Ulama uh, and you know at least the Naruto Ulama type of Islam uh, are generally moderate. You also beginning to see many groups uh, such as the Islamic Defenders Front uh, that was in the which was formed in 1998 uh, right after the collapse of the New Order uh, regime, which has become prominent in recent uh, uh, times because of its key role in uh, the Jakarta uh, rallies that it organized against uh, the Jakarta uh, governor Ahok for his allegedly uh, alleged blasphemous uh, remarks against Islam. Uh, other radical uh, groups such as the Forum Umat Islam, uh, this is an offshoot uh, of the Hizb Tahrir Indonesia, uh, which also played a very prominent role um, in, in this whole uh, scheme of uh, the anti ahok rally, but also in terms of the anti Ahmadiyya campaign, in terms of pushing Indonesia to become a lot more uh, intolerant, uh, uh, push pushing for the implementation of Sharia, uh, 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 you know, they are all again traditionalist group. Uh, one very good example, and perhaps the most example, the most important example, the Majlis Ulama Indonesia, uh, uh, which is led actually by Maruf Amin, uh, which has traditionally been very conservative. In fact, uh, the Islamic edict or fatwa that came out against uh, Ahok, in fact, was released or uh, was issued by the Majlis Ulama Indonesia. So I think when we think about traditionalism in the context of uh, Indonesia, there's a need for us to be a bit more nuanced. Can we move on? Now, in terms of traditionalism uh, uh, in Malaysia, I think um, in general, traditionalist Islam has um, uh, grown or at least has is uh, maintain its influence as a result of state-sponsored uh, Islamization. Now, uh, in general, you would find, for example, uh, the massive Islamic religious bureaucracy, which in fact was started by no other than Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, the current Prime Minister of Malaysia. Um, uh, you know, uh, is very much is staffed by traditionalist religious scholars. Now, um, there was some pressures from uh, the uh, groups, uh, movements that are linked to the Salafi, uh, the Salafi movement and also the Muslim Brotherhood linked movements uh, that essentially question or challenge uh, the position of the tradi traditionalist Muslim. Uh, in some cases, they were successful. So, for example, in the state of Perilis, uh, the state of Perilis uh, would be a state that, uh, in terms of its religious doctrine, it's a lot closer to the Salafi school, school of thought. Uh, but in general, the traditionalists have been able to uh, maintain their position precisely because uh, they have controlled the government religious bureaucracy. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see uh, right now what happens because uh, with the expansion of Salafism, with the growth of when the Salafi ulama joined uh, AMNO, uh, we saw a very strong traditionalist uh, pushback. Now, this happened um, through various fatwas that were issued by traditionally scholars against the, um, the Salafis in particular, but also against other minority communities such as the Shiites. Um, and perhaps as a way to up their game, you're also beginning to see uh, them issuing uh, what I would call fatwas uh, or addicts that were very political in nature. So one very good example of this uh, was the Mufti of the state of Pahang, who um, issued, uh, who made a remark referring to the Democratic Action Party, which is one of the component parties, a uh, Chinese, uh, a non-Muslim, uh, non-Malay based uh, party uh, that is currently part of the coalition government, um, as uh, Cafe Harbi. Uh, 
Now, the term Kafir Harbi uh, in Islamic jurisprudence has a lot of symbolism. Uh, it is basically a non-Muslim that is an enemy that you have to essentially kill. I mean, if you kill a, a Kafir Harbi, you'll be blessed by God. So it has a lot of um, significance. But And uh, this is perhaps a way for them to try to show that they also have, they can be equally uh, harsh in terms of their position uh, against uh, non-Muslims. Now, um, in terms of his manifestation, uh, one example, as I mentioned, um, extreme uh, conservative traditionalists is one uh, group that we're beginning to see. These are, there's a group called Pesatuan Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah uh, in, in Malaysia. Uh, one of his key leaders, uh, Ustaz Zamihan Mazin, uh, is notorious for basically making all sorts of remarks uh, against Shiites. Uh, against uh, non-Muslims, but perhaps his uh, most important target would be the Salafis. So the Pesatuan, uh, the the Ahlus Sunnah Wal Jamaah uh, have tried to uh, paint all Salafis uh, as terrorists. Essentially, that Salafism has contributed to the problem of ISIS and terrorism uh, in the country. So this is one of the rhetoric that uh, we see. Now the political traditionalists, I think. Um, what is perhaps uh, important to note here, and perhaps is relatively uh, under uh, sort of uh, discussed, uh, is the fact that PAS uh, is a traditionalist party. Uh, the vast majority of PAS leaders uh, come from traditionalist background. Uh, PAS control, PAS leaders control most of the pondoks in northern um, or Islamic boarding school in uh, northern Malaysia, uh, and PAS also. Um, has very little, most past leaders have very little tolerance uh, for the Salafi uh, school of thought. There are leaders, of course, who are associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, but many of them have left uh, to form the Parti Amana uh, National, uh, which is why I say it would be interesting to look at how the current uh, religious affairs minister, who is from Amana, who has uh, perhaps uh, links to Muslim Brotherhood affiliated movements, how he is going to handle uh, his bureaucracy that is largely staffed by uh, traditionalists. Uh, you are also beginning to see stronger association uh, uh, with uh, Sufism in Malaysia. So traditionalists today, or at least a group of traditionalists, would come out saying, look, we are not just traditional, we are also Sufis. So you would find many uh, events being organized, mammoth uh, events, often um, you know, uh, religious gatherings uh, where there would be uh, Sufi scholars coming sometimes reciting um, um, religious, uh, organizing religious uh, uh, rituals uh, in, a, in, in mass numbers and so on. So uh, what you would find, a very uh, good example of this is an Indonesian Sufi scholar, Habib Sheikh, uh, who um, is very, very famous in all of the three, um, I mean, in Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, there will be events being organized where they will uh, kind of sing uh, praises of the prophet uh, and, and so on, right? Uh, so this is something new that we're beginning to see with traditionalism in uh, Malaysia. Can we move on? Now, when we look at the, the Salafi traditionalist contestation uh, in uh, Indonesia, I think what is perhaps uh, interesting, and here I'm referring to not obviously the more moderate uh, wink of uh, Naharatul Ulama. I'm here looking at, um, you, you know, uh, what I would say to be the grassroots, uh, or at least a large portion of the grassroots of the Naharat ulama The common, fo co common focus, essentially, that you would find between Salafis and traditionalists, uh, or the common thread, is that of uh, Christians and uh, Chinese. And I think what, what is uh, interesting is that um, this has been utilized, uh, interestingly, by both Christian missionaries and also Salafi link uh, Islamist uh, groups uh, to try to raise funds, to try to, um, outside of uh, Indonesia, uh, to try to basically paint um, the picture to be a lot bleaker than it actually is. So a very good example of this was a campaign by Salafi affiliate, uh, uh, a Salafi affiliated organization based in the UK um, called the Save Mariam campaign, where it argued that there are several hundred thousand uh, Indonesian Muslims who have been converted to Christianity every year and as a result something needs to be done to counter this Christian uh, threat uh, and so they organize uh, um, you know uh, online um, uh, sort of uh, what do you call them um, a crowdfunding uh, type of um, uh, crowdfunding uh, 
uh, you know, to, to raise funds to, to counter this threat. And more recently, when you look at uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, earthquakes in uh, Sulawesi, uh, again, uh, you, you are also seeing, if you go online, you'll find a lot of Christian missionary groups um, trying to raise funds, basically to preach, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to Indonesian Muslims. Now, uh, another area I think is um, that we see uh, contestation is this issue of deviancy. Now, uh, when, you, when we look at these boundaries that have been drawn uh, by both Salafis and traditionalists, this issue of deviancy becomes important because if you do not fit within the boundaries, the symbolic boundaries that they have drawn, it means that you do not, um, you are no more a Muslim. You uh, are a deviant uh, Muslim or uh, at, at worst or at best you are a very, very uh, you know, bad Muslim. Uh, and I think this is interesting uh, to see because it is often when we look at Indonesia, we are, we are only looking at um, sort of the targeting of Shiites and Ahmadiyyas, Christians, Chinese and so on. But these debates are actually taking place within Sunni Islam, especially um, among the Salafis and traditionalists. And it can actually be uh, fairly... Um, um, I mean, it can be fairly uh, nasty, I would say, in terms of how they've dealt with each other. Another example, uh, you know, in terms of how this uh, contestation has taken place is this argument of, as I mentioned, the Islam Nusantara versus the Middle Eastern uh, Islam, which I have uh, basically argued is not quite, um, you know, as, sim uh, as simple as, uh, as it looks like, or at least it's been uh, the way it's made out to be. And lastly, uh, I think the equating of exclusivist attitude with Salafism. So when we read um, writings on Indonesian Islam, uh, often um, there is a, a broad stroke of painting any group that is exclusivist as being a Salafi oriented or at the very least is Middle Eastern origin and this is actually not quite the case. Uh, so groups like the Hezbo Tahrir uh, Indonesia for example, which is of course a transnational uh, Islamic movement, it's actually a traditionalist movement. Uh, it is very much um, traditionalist in terms of religious uh, doctrines. Uh, but when you, you know, look at the writing on, on his Tahrir, often, uh, you know, they would be associated somehow with Salafism. Another very good example is, Islamic, is the Islamic Defenders Front, the FBI, which I think is, is, is quite, it's quite funny because uh, Habib Rizik, the leader of um, the FBI, uh, would organize uh, Maulid events, Maulid, the celebration of the Prophet's birthday. And yeah, so it, it, it seems rather strange that anyone uh, would uh, would want to refer to Habib Rizik as, as a Salafi because the Salafis would irk at the idea, any Salafi would, would be so irked by the idea that you, you are allowed to celebrate the Prophet's birthday. Uh, next, please. In terms of the contestation in Malaysia, um, I think... Again, there is a common uh, threat as far as uh, many uh, the Salafis and traditionalists are concerned, uh, the Shiites. Uh, so again, when we think about um, you know, uh, traditionalists being more moderate, we need to think about the fact that most of the fatwas or people who have been pushing for the ban uh, against the Shiites are traditionalists. Uh, the other group that have been um, targeted are the liberal uh, Muslims and of course uh, increasingly Christians and Chinese, although in the case of Malaysia, uh, you don't see it as uh, strongly as compared to perhaps uh, Indonesia. Now, um, the traditionalists have also tried to use various legal mechanisms, as I mentioned, they control the religious bureaucracy to limit the influence of uh, Salafis uh, in the country. So you would find uh, Malaysia, another interesting feature of uh, Malaysian Islam is the fact that uh, Islam in Malaysia is federated. What it means is that uh, you have the uh, central uh, religious bureaucracy, but also at the state, Malaysia has 13 uh, states, they, each of these states has their own religious bureaucracy. And so uh, what is perhaps uh, you know, rather interesting and, and really uh, ironical in some ways is that uh, certain groups that are banned, uh, that are constantly considered deviant, let's say, in, in a state like Perlis, uh, would not be considered uh, to be deviant in the state of Perak or Johor and, and things like that. So there is a contradiction. Uh, so in many of these uh, state bureaucracies, the Salafis uh, have, uh, uh, have had problems preaching. Uh, so they would ban them from preaching. They would not give them permission to preach in the mosque in certain states. Uh, and another, just to give you uh, another very interesting example, there is a very famous 
um, um, Sufi uh, Brotherhood, uh, the Naqshbandi Haqqani uh, Brotherhood, uh, that is um, basically the official uh, Sufi Brotherhood or the royal family of, of the state of Perak affiliates themselves with this uh, uh, Sufi Brotherhood, the Otarika. Uh, whereas in the state of Perlis, uh, the Naqshbandi Haqqani is considered a deviant uh, movement. So this is the irony, perhaps, of uh, this this um, federated Islam management of Islam in Malaysia. As I mentioned, the association to terrorism. Um, so you would find that, uh, in essence, uh, Salafi is being targeted as being um, that the doctrines of Salafism supports uh, terrorism. That uh, it has given birth to groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, and this, of course, is a lot more complex uh, because, um, you know, there are certain, of course, more uh, violent manifestation of uh, Salafism. Uh, but the same can be said uh, about traditionalist Islam as well. Now, um, the Jewish conspiracy to destroy Islam. So what is perhaps interesting, uh, again, conspiracy theories are sometimes taken as facts in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and the there is a huge conspiracy in Malaysia that somehow... Uh, Salafism or Wahhabism uh, is in fact a movement that is linked to um, to the Zionist uh, movement. So you can see here there is a uh, on on the screen um, that essentially um, it is argued here that jihad is being fought everywhere uh, by Salafis uh, except in Israel, right? Just to show that somehow there is a link between the two. And uh, the political dimension of contestation, um, which is the uh, implementation of Islamic criminal law. So when the Salafis joined uh, AMNO, what was interesting was that we begin to see uh, essentially how um, this debate about the implementation of Islamic criminal law taking place. Uh, what was uh, interesting perhaps was that the traditionalists in past supported uh, the implementation or push for the implementation, whereas the Salafis um, there who were in AMNO and many Salafis outside of AMNO argued that essentially um, there's a need for a more progressive approach to the implementation of Islamic law. Now to conclude, next please. I think there's a need for us uh, when we are thinking of sectarianism in uh, Southeast Asia uh, to rethink some of these categories uh, beyond the Sunni Shiite divide. Um, because clearly as I have uh, shown in the last uh, hour or so, um, that the contestation taking place within uh, Sunni Islam is a lot more uh, evident or a lot more, um, I think, uh, it's, a lot more, it's a lot stronger than perhaps the Sunni Shiite uh, divide. And I think there's also a need for us to rethink some of the conventional uh, wisdom that we hold, um, you know, about somehow the peaceful apolitical traditionalists versus the violent political Salafis because, uh, again, uh, there are manifestations of violence on both sides and intolerance on both sides uh, of, of the divide. Uh, I have to caveat here that obviously uh, many of the jihadist groups um, in, in the world uh, are associated with uh, or at least a form of Salafism, uh, whereas we don't have examples of this uh, in, um, you know, you don't have examples of traditionalist uh, groups taking up uh, or, or embarking on terrorist activities. Uh, but I think this is an important uh, point to note that still, uh, in terms of thinking about moderate, radical, uh, vile, uh, tolerant, intolerant, we need to rethink some of our approach. Um, I think what is perhaps um, uh, important to note as well that sectarianism in Southeast Asia has also resulted in uh, both groups trying to up their game uh, or up their, their criticism or um, uh, strategies uh, against non-Muslims and Muslim minority sects. Uh, so the outcome of the sectarianism is really, um, well, both sides are pushing publicly because they want to show that they are a lot more Islamic than the other uh, for groups like the Shiites um, that more to, to be curtailed, uh, the Ahmadiyyas uh, to be banned uh, and so on. And I think sects uh, uh, manifest themselves, uh, as I mentioned, symbol uh, symbolically uh, in a variety of uh, different ways. So as I've said, both Salafism and traditionalist Islam have manifested itself in a variety of different ways. And yet they are strictly uh, vehemently 
uh, and intolerant uh, in contesting each other. So uh, again, uh, you can see the example of Malaysia about how the tradition is utilized, the religious bureaucracy against the Salafis, uh, and they can be extremely intolerant in terms of their approach. I'm going to end there and I look forward to uh, questions from all of you.